thought I was learning. I thought I was becoming a better person. And I was. But not without a cost. I was being red-pilled. Internet slang for right-wing brainwashing. And looking back, I see the appeal now. Look at Steph. He's strong. No one can hurt him. And looking back, I realize now that I wanted a taste of that power. I wanted to be strong too. I wanted to wield it against my enemy so that I would never be hurt ever again. The New York Times declares war on conservative YouTubers. Mr. Reagan. So a few days ago, my brother sent me a screenshot of the front page of the New York Times. They did a story on one guy who claims to have been brainwashed by far-right YouTubers. <laughs> my brother's comment was pretty funny. He wrote, Sorry, Chris, you didn't make the cover of the New York Times. Indeed, this is highly disappointing. Molyneux is on there three times, and I'm not on there once. What the hell? I'm a big deal, New York Times. I'm a big deal. I'm a big deal. <laughs> I'm a big deal. The author of this article was a guy named Kevin Roos. Kevin Roos is a far-left guy from a far-left family. Roos first rose to prominence after going undercover at a Christian university and basically writing a book about how crazy Christian students at a Christian university are. Or at least that's how it seems by the speeches I've seen him give. And I had to uh, go undercover um, technically, because I, I did want to be as honest with Liberty students as I could, and so I didn't use a fake name. I told them that I'd come from Brown, and actually a lot of them were, were very, um, I, I expected sort of raised eyebrows when I said that I'd come to Liberty from Brown, because I don't know how many people in the history of either school have ever done that, but uh, they sort of had, had pity for me. They would like, because they, they assumed that I was fleeing Brown uh, because it was so secular and so left-wing that I just couldn't take it anymore. And so they would say things like, well, I hope uh, liberty is a breath of fresh air for you. And so I, I uh, said, you have no idea. Um, Funny thing about this, Kevin actually claims that the experience rubbed off on him and made him a better person afterwards until enough time had passed and he reverted back to his old self. <laughs> So Kevin Roos is a guy who is perfectly willing to trick people into believing he is their friend and then writing a bunch of crap about them behind their backs for his own personal gain. This is the man who wrote the New York Times front page hit piece on conservative YouTubers. Sounds like a great guy. In this article, Kevin Roos wrote about a very specific young man, Caleb Kane, a young man with a lot of social problems. My mother hopped military bases, presumably to engage with men, although I'll never know for sure. But what I do know for sure is that she had me, left the state, and met my father. Now this man wasn't any better for me. And without slandering the man, I won't say any more at this time. But what I will say is that going to war and seeing horrible abuses that one's mind can hardly afford does not make for a stable environment. It was for this reason that I was raised by my grandparents. And my grandmother loved me dearly. Video games, toys. Perhaps she loved me a little too much. You know, the whole Norman Bates effect. Now, I'm not sure if Kevin Roos is aware of exactly how sinister using somebody like Caleb for this article was, but considering that for his first major public work, he befriended and betrayed a bunch of Christian students, including one that he actually dated, it doesn't appear that w it would have mattered to him one way or the other. But Caleb does not seem to be the best kind of person to thrust before the scrutiny of the public. From everything I've seen on Caleb's YouTube channel, he appears to be a lost soul in search of a community who will accept him. Instead of being that cool kid at school, I was an outcast, alongside my group of outcasts. It's that phrase, island for misfit toys. But college was a repeat of high school, and now once again left without that support structure, through no fault of my mentor or friends, I was lost. And once again, I went looking for love. Girls, friends, even a professor to look through the crowd and say, I see you. 
And look, I totally understand looking for some kind of community. That's what millions of young people have done since the dawn of time, and it's what millions of people are doing now and millions of people do in the future. But Caleb is an extreme case. He's the kind of person who is extremely susceptible to the manipulations of a charismatic leader. The first charismatic leader he found was Stefan Molyneux. Now, I would like to say that I like Stefan Molyneux. I've watched loads of his videos, and I think he's spot on, and I, I can't remember ever disagreeing with him. According to Caleb, however, Stefan was a kind of gateway drug into the alt-right and white nationalism, which I guess is what he became. He calls himself alt-light, having never crossed the threshold into full-on racism. So after Caleb uh, delved pretty deep into the alt-right stuff, he said that it started to scare him. There was something about the race aspect and also other ideas that the alt-right had that made me very nervous. Not even skeptical, but just afraid. So then he saw a debate between Lauren Southern and Stephen Bonnell, uh, who goes by the name of Destiny on YouTube. After seeing this debate, he says that he was shocked at how brilliant Stephen Bonnell was and how thoroughly uh, Lauren got destroyed. So I watched the entire two-hour debate and Lauren did not get destroyed. I'm actually not sure why Caleb thought this. I, I guess Lauren didn't seem to destroy Stephen Bonnell 100% of the time. So in the mind of Caleb, who at the time seems to have worshipped right-wing YouTubers, was disillusioned about conservative flawlessness in debate or whatever. But anyway, so from Stephen Bonnell, he got turned on to a YouTuber who goes by the name of ContraPoints. I had this aversion to her at first because I had all these goofy ideas about trans people, but Natalie, she just, she spoke to me. ContraPoint is an SJW trans dude who is actually pretty dang smart and was apparently on course toward a doctorate in philosophy, but realized he was a bit of a douche and chugged pictures of leftist Kool-Aid, turning him into a social justice warrior extraordinaire. And I must say his videos are really, really good. Aren't you discrediting yourself by using David Icke's vocabulary? Well, David Icke is selling a lot of books. Can the same be said of Horkheimer? Have you read Horkheimer? Yes. Have you read Kropotkin? Yes. Have you read Bakunin? No. You really can't understand these issues until you've read Bakunin. Now, his videos are not good so much in that the radical leftist ideas that he's perpetuating are brilliant, but the production quality, the humor, and the exquisite execution of propagandist techniques, brilliant. Really brilliant. Lenny Riefenstahl would be proud. In one instance, he talks about how nefarious advertising techniques are whilst employing advertising techniques to sell his viewers on the various points he's making. Uh, furthermore, the guy has a wicked sense of humor, and it makes total sense to me that Caleb Kane, looking for direction, was mesmerized by this ContraPoints guy. Another thing ContraPoints does in his videos is he talks without breaks, moving from point to point extremely quickly, not dwelling on anything. And this makes it very difficult to contradict him because you barely have time to process each point before he moves on to the next, something that I wouldn't know anything about because I would never do such a thing in my own videos. Okay, well, you know what? I'm right and he's wrong, so whatever. Now, I watched a few ContraPoints videos and I plan to watch a few more, and I think I'll make a video covering ContraPoints in, a, in much more depth in particular, his video about the alt-right, which is insane, but it's good. It's a good video, but it's insane. This video, however, is about the New York Times article, so let's get into it. The article is titled, The Making of a YouTube Radical. He begins by talking about the location. This is in Martinsburg, West Virginia. It says, Caleb Kane pulled a Glock pistol from his waistband, took out the magazine, and casually tossed both onto the kitchen counter. I bought it the day after I got the death threats, he said. The threats, Mr. Mr. Kane explained, came from the right from right wing trolls in response to a video he had posted on YouTube a few days earlier. In the video, he told the story of how, as a liberal college dropout struggling to find his place in the world, he had gotten sucked into a vortex of far right politics on YouTube. The horror. I fell down the alt right rabbit hole, he said in the video. I think buying a Glock is a little bit of a overreaction. I mean. Like, everybody on YouTube gets death threats. Mr. Kane, 26, swore off the alt-right nearly five years after discovering it and has become a vocal critic of the movement. He is scarred by his experience of being radicalized by what he calls a decentralized cult of far-right YouTube personalities who convinced him that Western civilization was under threat from Muslim immigrants and cultural Marxists, that innate IQ differences explained racial disparities, and that feminism was a dangerous ideology. I just kept falling deeper and deeper into this, and it appalled me because it made me feel a sense of belonging, he said. I 
was brainwashed. Over the years of reporting on internet culture, I've heard countless versions of Mr. Kane's story. An aimless young man, usually white, frequently interested in video games, visits YouTube looking for direction or distraction and is seduced by a, by a community of far-right creators. <laughs> Countless versions of Mr. Kane's story, really, because I haven't heard a single story like this. I heard, I've heard about people going from being radical left to reasonable right, but far right to far left? <laughs> yeah, not so much. And you know what? Countless is a great word if you don't want to be held accountable for making a false statement. You provide, you know, you provide no evidence to refute. You just, you just say that there are lots of stories like these. Countless, countless stories. Okay, you don't give us any, any examples. Just say that there's countless stories. Great. He says, seduced by a community of far-right creators. Okay. Seduced, really. That, that is like the most sinister way to describe what's happening. You can make anything sound sinister with, with like words like that. I can imagine this so-called journalist, Kevin, reporting on a convert to Christianity. He found God. He stopped drinking. He stopped hating himself. He was seduced by the allure of traditional Christian values. <laughs> Although in the case of this far-right YouTube creator, I can understand the use of the term. I mean, <laughs> look at me. Clearly, I am seducing people into conservatism. Am I right, ladies? <laughs> All right, that wasn't creepy. Okay. Some young men discover far-right videos by accident while others seek them out. Some travel all the way to neo-Nazism while others stop at milder forms of bigotry. What the hell? They literally leave no room for non-bigoted, political, right-wing Americans in this characterization. You're either a full-on Nazi or you're mildly bigoted. That is the spectrum. Sorry to my buddy Jason. I know you're a Cuban guy and your wife is black, but you're a bigot. Sorry, New York Times says so. The common thread in many of these stories is YouTube and its recommendation algorithm, the software that determines which videos appear on users' homepages uh, and inside the up next sidebar next to a video that is playing. The algorithm, the algorithm is responsible for more than 70% of all the time spent on the site. And here we come to the most dangerous part of the article. The, the paragraph here um, this is the call to action. This is the indirect request to YouTube that YouTube address this problem and better censor conservative content. And YouTube is complying. Because of requests like this from various other leftists in the media, YouTube has been, for the past few years, constricting the distribution of conservative videos, demonetizing us, and even banning us from the platform. Now, obviously, everybody knows what's happening to Steven Crowder at the moment, and I'm going to do another video on that, so I won't get into that here, but it, it's articles like this uh, that push YouTube to censor people like me. Even though my channel and several of my videos are steadfastly against bigotry, it doesn't matter because... I'm a right wing. I'm labeled as a bigot by people like Kevin Roos who wrote this article. The radicalization of young men is driven by a complex stew of emotional, economic, and political elements, many having nothing to do with social media. But critics and independent researchers say that YouTube has inadvertently created a dangerous on-ramp to extremism by combining two things, a business model that rewards provocative videos with exposure and advertising dollars, and an algorithm that guides users down a personal path meant to keep them glued to their screen. There's a spectrum on YouTube between the Walter Cronkite, Carl Sagan part, and Crazy Town, where the extreme stuff is, said Tristan Harris, a former design ethicist at Google, YouTube's parent company. If I'm YouTube and I, wanna, I, wa I want you to watch more, I'm always going to steer you toward Crazy Town. All right, Walter Cronkite, whose name for some reason I can't say, and Carl Sagan, these guys are both leftists. To this Google YouTube person, these are examples of the calm section. Okay, so neither one of them could have been a conservative, really? Let me tell you about the calm, moderate left. Okay, despite not hitting people over the head with bike locks, they too are dangerous, just as dangerous as your nonviolent white supremacist. How? Because the moderate leftist and the white supremacist suffer from the same affliction. They're both delusional. The moderate leftist suffers from... The delusion that women are oppressed and blacks are oppressed and gays are oppressed and trans, Muslim, immigrants, they're all oppressed, right? Tons of these groups are oppressed and vulnerable and they need protected status. And the oppressors? White people, men, Christians, especially white Christian men. It's easy to believe for many leftists because as ContraPoints acknowledges in one of his videos, 
he had these sexist feeling toward women himself, sexist feelings towards women himself. So the bigotry he sees in himself, he imagines is endemic of all men, but not all men merely objectify women. Many men respect women and appreciate their company. I often find that the far left white anti-racist activist is often secretly racist themselves. Much like the latent homosexual, their rejection of the thing they hate is actually a reflection of the thing existing within themselves. They pretend to hate racism because they themselves are guilty of it. They then project this feeling onto others because they imagine that if they're secretly racist, other people must be too. Anyone who says they're not a racist must actually be a racist. But not everybody is like you, leftists. Some of us don't care that much because we're genuinely not racist. We don't have to go around screaming about how evil racism is because we know racism, ra racism is bad and we assume everybody else is also past this, okay? See, we're guilty of projection too, but we're, we're projecting our positive values, our non-racism, while you guys are projecting your sinister ones. By the way, I love the word sinister. I know I've been using it a lot lately, but it's a good word, so I'm going to keep using it. So then the article goes on. In recent years, social media platforms have grappled with the growth of extremism on their services. Many platforms has, have barred a handful of far-right influencers and conspiracy theorists, including Alex Jones of Infowars, and tech companies have taken steps to limit the spread of political misinformation. YouTube, whose rules prohibit hate speech and harassment, took a more laissez-faire approach to enforcement for years. This past week, the company announced that it was updating its policy to ban videos espousing neo-Nazism, white supremacy, and other bigoted views. The company also said that it was changing its recommendation algorithm to reduce the spread of misinformation and conspiracy theories. With 2 billion monthly active users uploading more than 500 hours of video every minute, YouTube's traffic is estimated to be the second highest of any website behind Google.com. According to the Pew Research Center, 94% of Americans ages 18 to 24 use YouTube a higher percentage than for any other online service. Like many Silicon Valley companies, YouTube is outwardly liberal in their corporate politics. It sponsors, sorry, it sponsors floats, uh, at LGBT pride parades and celebrates diverse creators and its <laughs> diverse creators and its chief executive endorsed Hillary Clinton in the 2016 presidential election. President Trump and other conservatives have claimed that YouTube and other social media networks are biased against right wing views and have used takedowns like those announced by YouTube on Wednesday as evidence for those claims. True. In reality, YouTube has been a godsend for hyperpartisans on all sides. It has allowed them to bypass traditional gatekeepers and broadcast their views to a mainstream audience and has helped one once obscure commentators build lucrative media businesses. Also true, um, although that is now being stripped from us, which is not cool. YouTube has also been useful in uh, as a recruiting tool for far-right extremist groups. Bellencat, an investigative news site, analyzed messages from far-right far chat rooms and found that YouTube was cited as the most frequent cause of members, quote-unquote, red-pilling, an internet slang term for converting to far-right beliefs. Yeah, you know what red-pilling is also slang for? It's internet slang for converting to moderate conservative beliefs and libertarian beliefs, basically anything not leftist. So yeah, but you know what, New York Times? Scare the shit out of your audience and spread disinformation and continue to mischaracterize everything conservative throughout the entirety of your front page story. <sighs> Can you believe that this used to be the most respected newspaper in America? A European research group, Vox Poll, conducted a separate analysis of nearly 30,000 Twitter accounts affiliated with the alt-right. It found that the accounts linked to YouTube more often than any other site. All right, this journalist, Kevin Roos, keeps saying alt-right or far-right or whatever, you know, all these extreme terms, but 30,000 alt-right Twitter accounts? I'm not sure there are 30,000 alt-right people out there. Either Kevin is intentionally calling anything slightly right-leaning alt-right, or else he genuinely doesn't know the difference between moderate conservatives and white supremacists. Becca Lewis, who studies online extremism for the nonprofit Data and Society, is then quoted as saying, YouTube has been able to fly under the radar because until recently no one thought of it as a place where radicalization is happening. But it is where young people are getting their information and entertainment, and it's a space where creators are broadcasting political content that at times is overtly white supremacist. Good. Uhuru. Uhuru. What your name is? Jackson. Uhuru Jackson. You owe me reparations. I do. Why that? 
because I have benefited from the wealth that was stolen from mm -hmm. you, Tell as it. have all my ancestors, um, the ones who owned slaves and the ones who did not, the Jews in uh, the white Jews in Hungary. Ever. You better tell on the white Jews. Say that again. The white Jews in Hungary, the fake Jews. Yes, fake white Jews. Mm -hmm. Fake white Jews. But you know what? It's also a place where people are broadcasting stuff that's overtly black supremacist and Marxist and radical feminist and anti-Christian and Islamic extremist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? Let's not mention those other radical ideas. Let's only talk about the white supremacy. White supremacy is the only one of these extreme groups that is completely disavowed by everyone on the right and the left. Every other one of these radicals, and they're embraced by the left, right? The only one that is claimed to be on the right we on the right totally disassociate ourselves with, okay? I know that conservatives bring this up all the time, but if you want to be taken seriously, you have to distinguish yourself from your radical crazies, all right? We definitely do that with the radical crazies that you guys try to associate us with. We want no part of that, but you guys, you embrace your crazies, which is crazy. I visited Mr. Kane in West Virginia after seeing his YouTube video denouncing the far right. We spent hours discussing his radicalization. To back up his recollections, he downloaded and sent to me his entire YouTube history, a log of more than 12,000 videos and more than 2,500 search queries dating to 2015. These interviews and data points form a picture of a disillusioned young man, an internet-savvy group of right-wing reactionaries. You know, that's, that's another name, actually, that these guys have for us on the right right now, reactionaries. I didn't actually know this. I learned this from a ContraPoints video, and I looked it up, and apparently it's a pretty old and well-established word for conservative extremist. I had no idea. So you know what? Maybe I'm showing my gaps in knowledge here, but yeah, I guess I learned something interesting from these guys after all. <laughs> All right, so this guy's video log, he says, form a picture of a disillusioned young man who, an internet savvy group of right-wing reactionaries and a powerful algorithm that learns to connect the two. It suggested that, it suggests that YouTube may have played a role in steering Mr. Kane and other young men like him toward far, the far right fringes. It also suggests that in time, YouTube is capable of steering them in very different directions. Okay, so very much like an infomercial, the writer Kevin Roos has established a problem and a solution. The problem is that YouTube's algorithm steers people toward the far-right fringes. The solution is an algorithm that will bring him back from the brink. And I'm pretty sure that the unspoken message to YouTube is get rid of the far-right wing folks and draw people toward a much more sensible left-wing ideology. But what Kevin Roos fails to tell the reader is that Caleb's exit from the alt-right was conducted by ContraPoint, who advocates Marxism. Marxism is, by most people's definition, an extreme position. So it's not like Caleb went crazy white supremacist and then became a sensible moderate. He went from being a strong liberal in his youth to being a borderline white nationalist to being a Marxist. To be honest, I'm not sure that he's a full-on Marxist, but ContraPoint definitely defends Marxism. And ContraPoint seems to be Caleb's biggest influence at the moment. So, I don't know, much like a hard drug user with an addictive personality, Caleb seems to be drawn to ideological extremes, right, left, or whatever. That's not a conservative problem. That's a Caleb problem. You're going to find people drawn to extreme ideas in the world. Those ideas may be political or religious or, you know, countercultural or fictional. It might be rock star fandom or sports or eating or whatever. Some people just want extreme things. And you can't blame conservatives for that. Conservatives aren't racists. Racists are racist. Conservatives have always been against racism. And when I mean against racism, I don't mean they're against, you know, white people dressing up as black people for Halloween. I mean, they're against slavery and lynching and forced segregation and Jim Crow laws and calling all white people racist, which is in itself racist. Conservatives have always stood against real racism. This snowflake SJW BS stand against implicit bias. Yeah, that's not the kind of racism conservatives care about. That's the idea that people can use the word racism to justify their own hatred or to explain away personal shortcomings as the fault of systemic discrimination. Conservatives are the real deal. Genuine individualists. Leftists, you guys doth protest too much. Over time, he watched dozens of clips by Steven Crowder, a conservative comedian, and Paul Joseph Watson, a prominent right-wing conspiracy theorist 
who was barred by Facebook this year. He became entranced by Lauren Southern, a far-right Canadian activist, whom he started referring to as his fashy bae, or fascist crush. I'm sure she reciprocates the feeling. These people weren't all shouty demagogues. They were entertainers building their audience with satirical skits, debates, and you know, and interviews with like-minded creators. Some of them were part of the alt-right, a loose cohort of pro-Trump activists who sandwiched white nationalism between layers of internet sarcasm. Others considered themselves alt-light or merely anti-progressive. This sandwiching white nationalism between layers of internet sarcasm thing, this is the thing that I think is the most... I'm going to use the word sinister again. Sinister about, you know, what these kinds of leftists are saying. They're basically saying that anyone who appears to be a moderate conservative may well actually be a white nationalist or a white supremacist, and you don't know because they're being clever about it. So, like, I can't make a, a joke or do anything that might seem potentially racist, you know, in any way, because then it's like a little hit. Oh, look, so you can see the hints, and they try to... Anyway, I'll go over that in another video. These creators were active on Facebook and Twitter too, but YouTube was their headquarters and the place where they could earn a living by hawking merchandise and getting a cut of the money spent on advertisements that accompanied their videos. A few of them had overt ties to establishment conservative groups and there was little talk about tax cuts or trade policy on their channels. Instead, they rallied around issues like free speech and anti-feminism by portraying themselves as truth-telling rebels doing battle against humorless social justice warriors. Their videos felt like episodes in a long-running soap opera with a constant stream of new heroes and new villains. I, I hate that they cannot ever consider that maybe we're genuine. Like, maybe, you know, the reason that we're... <laughs> We have a problem with like, we want to talk about free speech and we have a problem with feminism and we call ourselves truth tellers, you know, doing battle against humorless social justice warriors. It's because that's true. I mean, this doesn't all have to be like some kind of a disguise for racism. You know, a lot of the stuff, that, everything that I talk about, genuine, like face value. Okay, I am transparent and open book. And I think the vast majority of other conservatives are like that too. Maybe there is some white supremacist pretending to be just a moderate conservative out there or... I, I don't know, whatever. It's, it's just, it's so stupid. Oh, they're all secretly evil. Come on. To Mr. Kane, all this felt like forbidden knowledge, as if by watching some YouTube videos, he had he had been lit, led, let into an exclusive club. He had, and he left it. So whatever, man. I think today, today, in today's climate, political climate, believing the truth is actually being led into an exclusive club because so many people are just like lying on the actual news. So if you want to hear the truth, you kind of got to go on YouTube and it does kind of feel like you're part of an exclusive club, which is silly, really. I mean, it's just silly, but whatever. I mean, that's just the way it is right now. Caleb says, when I found this stuff, I felt like I was chasing uncomfortable truths. You were, Caleb. <laughs> I felt like it was giving me power and respect and authority. Now, this is a huge problem. It's a huge problem with, with anyone who's highly susceptible to suggestion. It's a problem, you know, for Caleb himself. It's a problem for the YouTuber. It's a problem for society. It's a problem for Caleb because he feels special just for having a political perspective, which is not a good reason to value yourself. It's bad for the YouTube, uh, for for the YouTuber like myself or Stefan Molyneux because the fact that people like Caleb exist means that we have to be incredibly careful about being absolutely clear, and that's a problem for society because. When somebody with this kind of predisposition toward idolizing YouTubers gets tired of one charismatic leader, he'll move on to the next, and the next might not be as sensible as Molyneux. The next leader might be a white supremacist or Marxist. On the right, we don't call for violence, but people on the left, like Vox's Carlos Maza, do call for violence. And then they call for YouTubers like Steven Crowder to get deplatformed for teasing him. And don't worry, I am in the process of making that video too. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this next whole bit, but he goes on and he writes about a change to the YouTube suggestions algorithm whereby um, longer videos were given preference. Okay, and then he says, a month after its algorithm tweak, YouTube changed its rules to allow video creators to run ads alongside their videos and earn a portion of the revenue they generated. Previously, only popular channels that had been vetted by YouTube were able to run ads. Neither of these changes were intended to benefit the far right, and YouTube's algorithm had no inherent preference for extreme political content. It treated white nationalist monologue no differently from Ariana Grande, an Ariana Grande cover or a cake icing tutorial. But this guy doesn't define his term, so I have no idea what he means by white nationalist. I hate that he does. He does. He calls everything on the right white nationalist or alt right or what. I mean, come on, man. 
But the far, far right was well positioned to capitalize on these changes. Yeah, we're diabolical like that. Many right-wing creators already made long video essays or posted video versions of their podcasts. Their inflammatory messages were more engaging than milder fare, and now they could earn money from their videos, and they had a financial incentive to churn out as much material as possible. Yeah, you know what? God forbid a conservative churn out material. Heavens no. He might have an opinion that opposes that of Kevin Roos of the New York Times. Only videos that he approves should be produced and made available to the public. All other videos are fascist, white supremacist demagoguery. A few progressive YouTube channels flourished from 2012 to 2016, but they were dwarfed by the creators on the far right. Yeah, because you already had CNN, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, ABC, NPR, Huffington Post, Vox, BuzzFeed, Washington Post, Daily Show, Colbert Report, Slate, The New Yorker, PBS, The Economist, Bloomberg, Politico, and The New York Times. Need I go on? But they were dwarfed by creators on the right who had developed an intuitive feel for the way YouTube's platform worked and were better able to tap into an emerging wave of right-wing <laughs> populism. Okay, this guy is totally dismissing any possible positive values conservative YouTubers might have and replacing it with this sinister... You know, they had a feel for the way YouTube's platform worked. Really, they had a feel for it? Or maybe maybe they were just saying things that rang true to people. Maybe that there was no sinister motive to tap into right-wing populism. And maybe, like me, these YouTubers were just talking about their own genuine observations, expressing their own genuine ideas about things. And maybe their viewers were captivated by them because they were so genuine. But no, that, that couldn't be it. They had a feel for the way YouTube's platform worked, and they could tap into populism. This guy is the demagogue of all demagogues. You know, I know that word gets thrown around a lot, but this is really what it is. In case you were, in case you were uncertain, this is what a demagogue is. According to the dictionary, a demagogue is a person, especially an orator or political leader, who gains power and popularity by arousing the emotions, passions, and prejudices of the people. This guy, Kevin Roos, is trying to stir up fear and hatred amongst leftists in order to pressure YouTube toward tighter regulations against us. His pitch to YouTube is that, YouTube, let's make it so that you won't create another Caleb Kane. But what they really don't realize is that if the Caleb Kanes of the world didn't have the alt-right to radicalize him, they'll still have the radical left. And while trying to protect us from all the white supremacists, they've managed to punish Steven Crowder, who is in no way a white supremacist. But videos like this get to keep their monetization. Take, for example, the terms cracker, white trash, or redneck. White trash shows up next. It's believed to have originated in Baltimore in the 1820s as a way for Southern house slaves to disparage poor whites. All of these terms are rooted in classism. So are terms like cracker, white trash, and redneck racist? Well, no, they've been racialized, but they're not racist. Okay, so this next section criticizes YouTube for improving their algorithm and making YouTube more engaging to users. Yeah, how dare they improve their service? Disgusting corporate greed giving people what they want. Directing viewers to videos they'll actually like. Disgusting. The implication here is that extremists who want to see, you know, extreme content will get caught in an ideological bubble. But yeah, that's what happens with obsessive type people. And it's not good. And I would even be for directing people out of that, especially for viewers of, say, the Young Turks. But I highly doubt that YouTube tries to draw any Young Turks viewers to my channel. And also, this kind of interference by YouTube starts to infect channels that are not extreme. But YouTube's changes again played into the hands of far-right creators, many of whom already specialized in creating videos that introduce viewers to new ideas. What? YouTube viewers are being introduced to new ideas? Okay, you see, <laughs> the difference between the left and the right, the right embraces new ideas. The left is afraid of new ideas. Do you understand why? Because they're not confident that their ideas are superior. They understand that we are convincing. They know that when all the details are examined, the right will win. Our ideas are just better. The only way to, to curtail this is by convincing people that we're all bigoted and dangerous and by censoring our YouTube videos. They knew that a video calling out left-wing bias in Star Wars, The Force Awakens, might red pill movie buffs. I am literally working on that exact video 
No joke. <laughs> or that a gamer who ranted about feminism while streaming his Call of Duty games might awaken other politically minded gamers. And now YouTube's algorithm was looking to promote the same kind of cross-genre exploration. But that's great! Isn't the left always promoting young people voting? Oh, wait, yeah, no, no, they just want young people to vote because young people tend to vote for the left. If we awaken politically minded gamers, they might vote gasp for Trump. This section of the article is giving us conservative YouTubers way too much credit. This guy wants to scare the left into thinking we're all highly sophisticated social media masters who are gaming the algorithm and diabolically infecting the minds of our prey. In reality, I'm just making videos on subjects that I myself find interesting. If I'm outraged, I make a video. If I'm confused, I investigate, and then I make a video. If I'm excited, I make a video. That's how we make addictive videos, Kevin. That's our big secret. We're treacherous, I know. YouTube's recommendation system is not set in stone. The company makes small changes every year and has already introduced a version of its algorithm that switched on after major news events to promote videos from quote-unquote authoritative sources over conspiracy theories and partisan content. Oh, you know, that's really good because far leftists need to decide for all of us what quote-unquote authoritative sources are. And by partisan content, by the way, what they really mean is conservative content. So if you've got a left, a right, and a middle, then the, and you know, and the moderators are on the left, they don't think they're on the left. From their perspective, they're in the middle. So now the radical left becomes, you know, the moderate left, and the middle becomes the right, and the right become psychopathic neo-Nazis, right? Th this is why these people are not objective. They're on the left, but they think they're in the middle. All right, so I realized whilst recording this video that it is going on way too long. Sorry, I know I just turned really dark right now. <laughs> So I decided to split this video into two. So we're just gonna end this video here, and then if you wanna see the rest of it, I'll have that up shortly. So if you like this video, hit the like button. If you wanna see more like this, please subscribe and hit the bell. That's very important, I just found out that. But if you hate me, you might be a black supremacist. But don't worry, man. I'm fighting for you to stay on YouTube. Good night. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose that war, and in so doing lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening.